Hello and welcome to the Parker Files, where today, after numerous requests, we're going to be taking a look at my Hot Toys collection and what I currently use to display it. If you're new to the channel, there'll be more Marvel six scale figures and diorama reviews coming your way, so be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss those. If you are a subscriber, thank you for stopping by once again and your ongoing support of the Parker Files. My current display is housed in six Magi cases, of which there are two DF60s, two DF120s, and three custom sizes on the left of the display. When I started collecting three years ago, I did a lot of planning and research for how I was going to display my collection. I thought it out and drew it out numerous times, and no matter how hard I looked at IKEA, I just couldn't come up with what I needed for the direction I wanted to take my collection in. And then one day, out of nowhere, thankfully, I stumbled across Magi cases. The standard sizing options, the ability to customize cases, and the fact that the entire display is modular, all these things made it an easy choice for me. While the wait time is less than ideal, the finished result is exactly what I was looking for, and I couldn't be happier with the display. If you're interested in the Magi cases and would like some more detail and information, I did an assembly and review video, and you can find that video on my channel, or by using the link in the description of this video. Alright, enough about the display. What we're going to do now is take a look at each case one by one. I'll show you the figures and talk about other details that you'll see in the displays as well. First up we have my Asgard throne room display. This display is housed in a DF60 and I love the juxtaposition of the figures here. Odin and Thor centered in royal Asgard colors, and Loki and Hela on the outer sides in greens and blacks. This version of Loki is from the Thor Ragnarok line, and while I wouldn't say it's a perfect release, in my opinion, it is the strongest Loki release we've gotten to date. This version is tailored really well and the sculpt works for me, at least for now, until the updated original release comes along. I'm hoping that release becomes the definitive Loki figure. Behind Loki is the Allfather sitting on the throne. This Odin figure is from the first Thor film, and while it's certainly dated, I do think it's a strong release and one that still holds up. I had a hard time acquiring this figure, but I'm glad I did, as I don't see this figure being re-released, and I don't see how I could have a Marvel display without him. The throne is made by a company called Toys Box, and while it's not as screen accurate as I would like, I do like the detail in the sculpt and the vibrancy of the paint app. I have plans for a custom made throne down the road, but for now, I like how this looks and I think it works well in this display. The Age of Ultron Thor is the second figure I bought after I started collecting three years ago. It's tragic that one of the strongest characters in the MCU needs propped up by a figure stand, but as cliche as it sounds, the ankles on this figure are its Achilles heel. I'm a sucker for this classic look for Thor, and even though this head sculpt isn't as accurate as I would like, I can't say the same for Hela from the Ragnarok film. Her head sculpt is stunning, one of Hot Toys best in my opinion, and I love the look of this figure. Yes, she's a bit undersized and I wish we had gotten a second head sculpt, but those gripes aside, this figure is hella good. So there you have my Asgard display. I hope to get more figures like Heimdall and Valkyrie. I'd love to get a Korg and a Meek to add to this display, but until then, I'm happy with how this looks. Right beside the Asgard throne room is the Wakanda throne room. I know that neither Odin or King T'Chaka sit on these thrones anymore, but I'm okay with the current inaccuracy of both these displays and the symmetrical stories they tell side by side. Killmonger was an incredible character in the Black Panther film, and while this figure went through a lot of changes pre-release, I'm glad that he's on my shelf now and I love how he looks. The King T'Chaka figure was a Toy Fair exclusive from 2018, and while this look was only seen for a few seconds on screen, he's still an imposing figure with staying power on my shelf. I love the regal colors of his sash against the blacks and golds of his outfit. The Wakanda Throne is a Hot Toys release, and I for one wish Hot Toys did more accessories like this. It's really well done, and I love all the details throughout. Shuri came out of nowhere to steal every scene she was in in the Black Panther movie, and her figure release did a similar thing in the collecting community. The buzz over her likeness was unavoidable, and while she does have some limitations, the quality of her head sculpt and the details in her tailoring are some of Hot Toys' best. Chadwick Boseman will always be the Black Panther, and while I have issues with this figure, I will never replace it. You can't tell the story of Wakanda without T'Challa, and you can't tell the story of the MCU without Chadwick Boseman. Well, there you have my Wakanda throne room display. 
It's set up intentionally to tell the story of what and who was between two great characters in the MCU, and it also foreshadows who may be stepping up and out to take the mantle of the Black Panther. Wakanda Forever Next up is a random display of characters. Some of them go together and others are completely out of place, but I had to put them all somewhere. Two of the figures in this display are ones I couldn't live without, and two of these figures are some of the favorites in my collection. First up is a Skrull minding his own business in a destroyed part of New York City. This figure uses the Talos head sculpt and hands by Toys Era, and the body and outfit from the SoSo -So Toys Quicksilver 2.0 figure. Moving on, we see the deluxe version of Hawkeye with the Ronin outfit. And if you're interested in my thoughts on this figure, you can check out the review on my channel. Beside him is the Man with No Fear, and I hope the rumors are true and that we'll see Charlie Cox reprise his role as Matt Murdock and Daredevil in the MCU. I love the Daredevil and Punisher series on Netflix, and I love this figure of the Punisher even more. In fact, this figure is in my top 5 underrated figures of all time. The head sculpt is flawless, and the detail on the clothing and weapons is exceptional. The Marvel logo light box from Hot Toys is front and center in this display of characters who aren't A-list players in the MCU. But isn't that what Jesus taught? The last shall be first? Next up is the dynamic duo from the film that bears their name. This is the third version of Ant-Man, and while the head sculpt is a joke, I love this figure on its own. It's detailed and vibrant, and it looks perfect when standing next to the Wasp. The Wasp isn't a character I love, but it's a figure I had to have. It's so well executed on almost every level, and for a character who can shrink on screen, this release does anything but that on my shelf. The Wasp takes up space and catches your eye, but not like the Hulkbuster. Like most collectors, this figure is a cornerstone of my collection and a conversation piece like none other. I have plans to move this showstopper into its own display case, but for now, he towers over the Ant-Man and the Wasp. This display is full of some amazing characters and figures, and while they're random at best, I love that they each have a home on my shelf and in my collection. Before moving on, I also wanted to point out some of the dioramas used in this display, both of which are from a company called Diorama Inbox Studio. You can find them on Facebook, like I did, and they have a number of different high-quality dioramas for all kinds of lines and displays. The first one is called Warzone. There are a couple of different sizes and color options for this diorama. This one is the large size and it has a bit of a brown tint to it. It also comes with some small extra pieces that I've scattered across the front of this display, as well as on top of the stand for the Wasp. The second diorama is called Eagle Steel. The base of it is a rubble building, much like the Warzone display, with a beautifully sculpted and painted eagle head sticking out of the rubble. Both of these dioramas are incredibly detailed, and I love how they look and what they add to this display. The next display is the Guardians of the Galaxy, and while I know the figures in this display have some MCU timeline issues, I chalk it up to creative licensing for this group of rebellious misfits. While I like some of the other versions of Groot that have been released, this is the Groot I think of when I think of the character, and I love the intricate detail for such a simple release. Beside Groot, we have Gamora from Guardians of the Galaxy 2, and if you're interested in my thoughts on whether this figure was worth waiting 933 days for, you can check out the review on my channel. Another release from that line is this deluxe version of Star-Lord. This figure is in my current top 10 figures in my collection due to the quality and tailoring, quality and quantity of accessories, and overall likeness to Chris Pratt. And yes, Star-Lord is aiming at the Trash Panda, I mean Rocket from the Endgame line. I did a review of this figure as well, and like Groot, when I think of Rocket, this is the version I think of, and I love how he looks in this display. Moving on, we see Nebula, another figure I've done a recent review of. The detail in this figure is incredible, and this head sculpt of Karen Gillan as Nebula may be one of the best Hot Toys has ever done. I say one of the best, but the best head sculpt Hot Toys has ever done, in my opinion, is this sculpt of Michael Rooker as Yondu. This head sculpt, in fact, this entire release is out of this world, figuratively and literally. It currently sits in the top 10 figures in my collection, and it's going to be hard to knock it off that pedestal, even though he has a hard time standing on his own. Behind him, we have the Stan Lee and his astronaut costume, which was a Toy Fair exclusive from 2019. I'm a sucker for these Stan Lee cameo releases, and I personally hope we get more. In fact, I'd love to have an entire display of all of them one day. I'd also love to get an updated version of Drax. This release is from the first Guardians film, and I have him standing at the back of this display because the distance creates an illusion to cover up the proportion issues that he has. 
I can't believe we still haven't got a second Drax figure to close out that second line. Before we move on, I want to point out a couple of other things in this display. The first is the moon rocks used here. These are actually aquarium accessories that I picked up at a local pet store, and you'll see some others later on in another display. These were cheap to buy, but they're really detailed and they create a nice size and depth for the overall look of this display. I wanted to get a few more to fill out the case, but they're all sold out and I can't find any more anywhere. The other thing I wanted to point out are the bases and backdrops. You see the ones in the Guardians display here, and these, along with all the others in my collection, were done by my friend Dean at Backdrops and Bases. Dean is a stellar guy and he does incredible work. You can find the link to connect with him in the description. These are printed onto a foam display board using UV matte inks, which means there's no glare. And the quality of both the material and printed images is second to none, as is Dean's customer service. He's quick to respond and he's really helpful in coming up with ideas and sourcing images. If you're in the market for backdrops and bases, do yourself a favor and reach out to Dean. Again, his link is in the description. The next case in my collection houses the majority of my villains from the MCU. And while there are a lot of figures in this display, I do wish Hot Toys would give us more villains from these films. This case and the remaining two are custom sizes, and even though they're just shy of 60 inches wide, I do wish I had gotten them a little bigger, because as every collector knows, the figure you can get is always better than the one you have, and you can run out of room quickly. Maybe Thanos was onto something. First up is the Sandman diorama base from the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man 3 release. I know he's not a part of the MCU, but I hope he will be, and even if that doesn't happen, this figure is going to be moving into my Spider-Man display that I'm currently working on. Hashtag stay tuned. Behind Sandman is Obadiah Stane from the first Iron Man film. The head sculpt was taken from the Ironmonger figure behind him, and the body is a generic one I got online. The outfit is the ZC Toys MH Volume 6 outfit, and while it works for now, it's not the quality Obadiah would wear or the quality I want on my shelf. I'm going to be replacing it soon with one from Daft Toys. The Ironmonger figure is another underrated figure in the Marvel Hot Toys line. I mean, for its age, it's really well done. The size is imposing and the paint app and detail are right up there with newer releases. I had a hard time finding this figure, but it was well worth the hunt. Another equally impressive and underrated release is the Ultron Mark I. There is so much fine detail in this figure, it's creepy, but in the best way. Along the back of this display are three Chitauri figures. The one in front is the Commander, while the other two are foot soldiers. To me, these are the stormtroopers of the MCU. You can't have just one, so I got three. And they're all in the back, not because they aren't important to the MCU story, but they're back there because they're subpar releases, at least in my opinion. The detail on the paint app is solid, and they work well in the background of a more crowded display like this. Moving up front, we see the Mandarin from Iron Man 3, and the likeness to Ben Kingsley as Trevor Slattery is undeniable and exceptional. But unfortunately, the quality and greatness of this figure is overshadowed by the disappointment of this character in the movie. And as sad as that is for Trevor, that can't be said about Thanos. This figure is in my current top 5. I love it. The size is overwhelming, the detail in his clothing and the Infinity Gauntlet is flawless, and that head sculpt its as imposing as the Mad Titan himself. Dwarf beside Thanos is a Talos Kitbash. The head sculpt of Ben Mendelsohn is off the director Krennic figure from the Star Wars Rogue One line. The glasses used here are from the Bruce Banner figure from the Avengers line, and the suit is a Daft Toys release. Moving to the back once again, we see Ultron Prime. I wouldn't say this is a beloved figure to most collectors, but it's one I felt they needed for my display. Overall, I think it looks great, though the head sculpt itself is its weakest part, which is unfortunate, and what can't be said about the red skull. I did a retro review of sorts for this release, and while it's one of the oldest figures in my collection, it holds up against some of today's best head sculpts. Both of them do. Yes, this figure came with two head sculpts, and they're both high rated in my opinion, even by today's standards. Yes, the clothing is a bit puffy, but overall, I love this figure and I love how it looks on my shelf. The last two figures in my villains displays are both of Whiplash, and both from the Iron Man 2 line. First up is the Mark 1 version of Ivan Vanko as Whiplash. This is the original version, and while the updated one was impressive, it didn't solve the inaccuracy of the clothing, so I think this one holds up and is on par in terms of quality and overall likeness to Mickey Rourke. It took me a while to find this figure, and I paid more than I should, which is sad when they just re-released it a few months later after I got it. But that's how it goes, and not so with the Mark II behind it. I found this release easily and paid way under retail for it. 
Like Ultron Prime, I wouldn't say this is a collector favorite, but unlike Ultron, I think this release is great in terms of size, weight, detail, and overall shelf presence. The rocks used in this display are two different styles, but both from the same store, the pet store. These rocks are from the reptile section at my local pet store, and they're a cheap way to create a realistic display. The center stage of my current display is for the Avengers. And this isn't just a collection of Earth's Mightiest Heroes, this is a collection of my childhood heroes and some of my favorite figures in my collection. First up is that adorable Flurkin Goose. I know it's not the greatest looking cat in the world, but it was an accessory from the Captain Marvel Deluxe figure that I thought looked better next to Nick Fury than it did sitting wasted in a box. This Nick Fury figure from Captain America the Winter Soldier is another figure to be added to the most underrated figures list. Yes, it's a simple release, but that head sculpt is on par with most in my collection. Moving on, we have Thor and Hulk paired side by side, and I love how this looks, even though I don't love this Infinity War version of Thor. I'm more of a purist at heart, and that's one of the reasons why I love this first Avengers version of Hulk. And that said, while I don't love this look for Thor or that Stormbreaker is a little underwhelming, I do love this figure in terms of overall shelf presence beside Hulk. Next up is Bucky Barnes from Captain America Civil War. For me, this is the definitive version of Bucky, as I don't have any plans to get the recent version from the Disney series. I do like the look of that figure, but what I really want is my current grail. And that grail is the Winter Soldier from Captain America the Winter Soldier. Fingers crossed for a re-release on that one. Behind him is the new Captain America. I did a review of this Falcon a while back, so check that out. And while I love the look for the new release for Falcon as Captain America, this is the one for me, at least for now. Crouching down and quickly forgotten is Quicksilver from Age of Ultron. Of every figure in my collection, he holds the record for the lowest amount paid. Moving on, we have Black Widow from the Civil War film. And while I would prefer sculpted hair, I have to say this figure, for me and for now, this is the definitive look for Scar jo as Black Widow. I may think differently once we get some new announcements from the upcoming film, but until then, this is my Black Widow. Next, we have the Scarlet Witch from Civil War, and I love the look of this figure. This was a highly sought after figure up until the recent announcement of the figure from the WandaVision series, and part of me regrets not letting go of this figure prior to that announcement. But what is grief, if not love preserving? Moving to the back, we see a couple of kit bashes. The first is Hawkeye, and to get this look, I'm using the Age of Ultron body and outfit with the head sculpt from the Endgame Deluxe release. This gives me the classic purple comic look, which I love, and it allows me to take advantage of the best Jeremy Renner head sculpt we've gotten to date. Beside him is Talos, and for this look, I'm using the body and outfit from the Nick Fury's Avenger figure with another set of the Toys Era head sculpted hands. The pop he's holding was an accessory that I picked up off eBay. These head sculpts are really good, and I have a few more of them that I intend to use in other kit bashes down the road to add various scrolls into my display. Hovering over these two is the one and only Doctor Strange. This figure is the one from the Infinity War line, and this, this is such an awesome figure. The details in the head sculpt and tailoring are first class, and there are so many different textures and colors catching your eye from every angle. I mean, this one, it gets me every time. I love this figure. Just in front of him is Captain Marvel, and this is the first figure I did a review of after starting the Parker Files. It certainly has its flaws, which I detailed in that review, but to me, this figure stands out on a display like this because of the colors in the costume and the type of materials used. I'm currently working on a casual look for Carol Danvers so I can take advantage of this head sculpt and the second one, but that will be down the road when I change up my display. Front and center is my childhood hero and the figure that got me into the rabbit hole known as Hot Toy Collecting. This is the first figure I bought for obvious reasons and I love this so much. The detail in the costume, the texture, the colors, the eyes, it's Spider-Man and this one is with me for life. I could sell the rest of my collection tomorrow, but Spidey is staying put on my shelf. All the way in the back, we get a closer look at the New York City backdrop that Dean printed for me. It looks amazing. We also see Maria Hill, or is it a scroll? Either way, this is a figure I got in a moment of Hot Toys release drought. In terms of figure score or rating, this is one of the lower ranking figures in my collection, but I like having her on my shelf for the full MCU story. And you can't begin to tell that story without Iron Man. I reviewed this Mark 85 recently, so be sure to check out that video and see if my thoughts on this release line up with yours. 
There are so many Iron Man options and it's hard to have just one, but if I had to, the Mark 85 is it. The same is true of War Machine. There are so many variants of this character and as you can see throughout my collection for the most part, I try and have just one version of each character and I was torn between the Civil War and Infinity War versions of War Machine. But after going back and forth, I eventually decided on the Mark IV and I'm glad I did. Vision was one of my least favorite characters in the MCU, and I picked up this version mainly out of necessity and because the price was right. That said, I enjoyed him in the WandaVision series, and now I'm at least a little more thankful I have him on my shelf, though the jury is still out on whether or not I'll get the latest release. I had similar reservations about picking up this Endgame version of Captain America. I detailed why I almost passed on it in a review I did for this figure, and why I'm so glad that I didn't. This is America's ass, and I love having him on my shelf. Before we get to the last case, let me just show you the different dioramas used in this display. There are a number of different pieces, some of which are Hot Toys, and the rest are from Diorama Inbox Studio, which I mentioned earlier. Cap is standing on a piece called Street of War, as is Doctor Strange's base. Both of these come with the guardrails that you see in different positions in the display. Vision, Iron Man, and Thor's flight stand bases are all covered up with the bases from the Hot Toys Chitauri figures, while War Machine, Hawkeye, and Bucky are all standing on Diorama Inbox Studios' Warzone pieces, but the smaller size. Scarlet Witch is standing on a second large Warzone diorama, like the one that you saw the Punisher on previously. The destroyed Iron Legion accessory is from the Ultron Mark I figure, and the rest of the little accessories you see scattered around are from the various dioramas from Diorama Inbox Studios. Last, but certainly not least, we have Tony Stark's Workshop and the Hall of Armor. It was my desire to have this setup that prompted the Magic Case purchase, as I needed something wide enough to house all seven armors. And while this custom case is wide enough to do that, I recently got another case that's even wider so I can take this display to another level, even after adding the seventh hall for the highly anticipated Mark I diecast figure. First up, we have a kit bash of Peter Parker that uses the gang hood outfit from the Infinity War movie. The backpack, headphone, and mask are from the Homecoming release, and the head sculpt is from the Iron Spider release. I'm going to put the upgraded suit head sculpt on this eventually, I just keep forgetting to bring it to the office. This one six scale centipede arcade game is made by New Wave Toys. They have all sorts of different arcades that are incredibly detailed and accurate. In fact, you can actually play these, except this one's out of order. The screen died on it a little while ago and I'm waiting for a replacement along with a couple of other arcades for the new display that I'm working on but you'll have to wait to see those, just like Peter here. Here we have Pepper Potts from the Iron Man 3 film and Agent Coulson from the Avengers line. I hate to say it, but this Pepper figure is a bit of a hot mess. I really wish we could get an updated version because to me, she doesn't look anything like Gwyneth Paltrow. I hate that her hair is so straw-like and the fact that she can't stand up on her own, but with all those negatives said, I couldn't imagine having this type of display without her in it. So for now, I'll live with things the way they are and keep my eyes focused on other figures as she keeps her eyes on the Daily Bugle. The Agent Coulson figure was a steal of a buy off a local seller, and this is one of those figures that's overlooked and underrated, even though it's a fairly old release. Doing this video has rekindled my love and appreciation for a lot of the figures in my collection, and this is one of them. The head sculpt holds up really well and the quality of the tailoring and accessories is equally on point. Moving over to the other side of the display we have Dumb E from the Workshop set. This is an awesome accessory. It's detailed and it's painted really well and though I often think it's a bit undersized, I love how it looks and what it adds to this display. Beside Dumb E is Bruce Banner and Steve Rogers taking a look at the Nano Gauntlet while munching on some donuts. This is just an excuse to try and leverage some great accessories from the workshop set, along with the coffee and donuts from the Iron Man Mark IV release, the Crossbones helmet from the Civil War cap release, and the suitcase from the Mark V Iron Man release. There's also a broken leg there from a Mark IV Iron Man that I got sent from Sideshow that was damaged. The Bruce Banner figure is of course from the Hulk Banner Deluxe set, and it's unfortunate that this isn't a stronger figure in likeness, as I don't see us getting another one. The Steve Rogers was an eBay pickup of sorts. I bought the body and outfit from eBay and then used the head sculpt from the Civil War cap that I have in storage. I was planning on swapping it out for the Endgame sculpt, but sadly it doesn't fit as the neck on that one is too long, so I have to figure out a solution there so I can use that Endgame sculpt because it's way too good to just sit in a box. Now on to the Hall of Armor. Every time I watch the early MCU movies, I want to look at this display and these figures. And every time I look at these figures, I want to go back and watch one of the movies they're in. It's a vicious circle. 
The Mark II is a little undersized, but I don't hate on that too much. Hot Toys were just figuring out how to build incredible die-cast figures, and sometimes, sometimes you gotta run before you can walk. The Mark III also has its fair share of limitations, and I hope one day we'll get a redo of this figure, because I think it would be an insane release given what Hot Toys have proven they can do now. So fingers crossed for that and the Mark I. The Mark IV is one of my favorite designs and one of my favorite Iron Man figures. Apart from the Mark 85, to me it's the closest to that classic comic look which I'm a sucker for. And while the engineering in this figure is amazing, it doesn't hold a candle to that of the Mark V. It's mind-boggling to me how such a scene-specific figure could warrant such a hefty price tag. But as we've seen as collectors up until the recent reissue drop, this figure was fetching some serious coin. And while I have to give it its props for being an incredible feat of engineering, and while I appreciate the uniqueness it brings to the Hall of Armor, I don't have the mad love for the Mark V that a lot of other collectors do. The Mark VI, however, is an entirely different story. This is my favorite of the original seven. It's crossed over so many films and it crosses so many boxes of things that I love about the die-cast armors. It has the engineering of the Mark IV, but the additional details and vibrancy of the colors, the size, the weight, the lifelike pitting, and the uniqueness of that arc reactor, I mean, I could go on and on and on. I love the Mark VI. I also love the Mark VII. This again is so unique and it really does serve as the culmination of Tony's brilliance. As you go through each armor one after the other, you can see his evolution in parallel with that of his armors. I love this display, and I'm looking forward to adding to it as new figures are released. Last up we have Tony Stark himself with the workshop floor. This is the body that came with the set, but with the Mark IV head sculpt. I was planning on adding a newer sculpt, but as you can see, you can't remove the neck peg on this body. To remedy this, I've ordered the Tony Robert kit. Yes, I said that right, the Tony Robert body with arc reactor kit. It's a Tony Stark body with different arc reactors that you can swap out. I'll likely put this outfit on that body and use the Mark 46 head sculpt. I was hoping that the Mark 85 sculpt would have been better, stronger, but it's not. So for now, I'll use the 46. The base of the workshop is bigger than I expected. So much so, I can't even get the front piece on or the rest of the floor section added. It's a massive display, but as you can see, it's incredibly well detailed. In my new display, I've picked up some accessories to have it and the rest of the Hall of Armor lit up continually, and I can't wait to get all these little upgrades and updates done. It's going to look killer, and I can't wait for you to see it. Well, there you have it. That's my Hot Toys collection, Mark 1. Curating a collection is a very personal thing, and what each person values and why they value it is and should be up to that individual alone. My collection is mine. I collect it for me, and I plan to pass it on to my son Parker. I don't have any illusions about my opinions as a collector or the way I choose to display my collection. I certainly don't think my way is the right way. For example, I don't like to use stands. I prefer dioramas. I don't collect lines of figures. Instead, I mismatch figures and timelines. As a collector, I don't want every figure. As a collector, I want to try to tell my son a story with my collection. Again, I don't think my way is the right way. It's just my way, and it's for my son. So whatever you love, whatever you collect, and however you choose to display it, go for it. I hope, like me, you enjoy seeing other people's collections as it can inspire you as you create and curate your own. I've learned so much over the last couple of years looking at how other people display their collections, and it's awesome how inclusive and accessible so many collectors in our community are. I should say, if you're interested in learning more and being part of a community, check out the Six Scale Scavengers YouTube channel and podcast. The show is hosted by Brian, Chris, and TC, three of the greatest guys I've never met. And through their show and the private Facebook group, they and the rest of the admin team have provided a great forum for collectors to share tips, ask questions, and enable one another on this ridiculous journey of collecting hot toys. Thanks again for taking some time to look at Mark 1 of my collection. I hope that you've enjoyed this video and that you want to stay tuned for more. If so, take a second and hit that subscribe button. There'll be more six scale figures and diorama reviews coming your way. But until then, stay safe and collect because you can.